The Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago doesn't look much like a prison from the outside. In fact, it looks like a rather unassuming skyscraper. But why is this the case? Well, it could be thanks to the exclusive use of vertical slit windows, it might be because the building is triangular, or perhaps it's mostly because no one expects a prison to be inside a skyscraper. You see, after Chicago's prison system became a nightmare in the 19th century, officials sought to find a balance between a harsh confinement method and treating people with basic humanity. This was the city's ongoing struggle. Hence, the Metropolitan Correctional Center was meant to hit the sweet spot between those two priorities, with the hope of leading the rest of the prison system by example. Today we discover Chicago's skyscraper prison. I'm your host Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's start off with the context, as throughout the 1800s, the Chicago prison system was basically a very unpleasant place to be. And it was for this reason that by the turn of the century, new holding facilities still needed to be established. Usually justice was delivered swiftly through extreme punishments like public flogging, pillories, or just a death sentence. Well, 1831 revisions to the Illinois Correctional Code prohibited public pillories and floggings that were still permissible in private spaces. So in 1932, when Chicago was newly founded, the city created an astray pen in the town square. It had been made into a log cabin type jail a year later. From there, Chicago and Cook County erected a courthouse in 1853, including a basement jail, rooms for jailers, a sheriff's office, and a watch house. The courthouse no longer exists as it was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1871. Hence in that same year, the House of Corrections opened in Chicago's southwest side after the fire. It was mainly used to hold people who couldn't pay their fines, but it was also typically used to hold witnesses to crimes alongside the accused they testified against. During this time, the police station house lockup was used as the standard for criminal custody. Lockup had horrible conditions, being filthy and severely overcrowded, but new and improved facilities for prisoners were finally set up in the late 1890s. County jail also added separate areas for female and juvenile offenders in 1896. So at this point, all state executions were moved from the county jails to the state penitentiaries in 1928, but the situation was still challenging. The county jail had underpaid and untrained guards whose enforcement methods encouraged gang behavior among inmates. As such, a civil service system was created in 1967 to prepare officers for jail duties. And so it was. The nation's first centralized training school for correctional officers was opened by the Illinois Department of Corrections at St. Xavier University in 1974, leading us towards the erection of Chicago's notorious skyscraper prison. The 1960s and 70s saw a prisoner's rights movement sweep across America. At the same time, Cook County Jail saw a wave of inmate murders, suicides, escapes, and disturbances. There were also three class action lawsuits against the jail system over a lack of mental health services for prisoners and an allegation of racial bias in inmate classification. So in response to the outrage and increased scrutiny, a massive building program across Chicago took place in the 1970s. During all of this, the Metropolitan Correctional Center was built as a part of a federal program to demonstrate humanitarian prison conditions. Two other Metropolitan Correctional Centers were built, one in New York City and one in San Diego. The Chicago Center was created in response to a need for harshness and punishment, but also a need to provide decent and humane conditions for the inmates. It also needed more room to house more prisoners, inspiring the striking design. The Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago was designed by famous architect Harry Weiss. Construction began in 1971 and was finished in 1975. When finished, it was a 28-floor tall skyscraper with a unique design choice and shape. It boasts a right triangle shape instead of a standard rectangular one. This is also practical as the triangular design gives guards clearer sight lines over the prisoners. Furthermore, the correctional center being both triangular and a skyscraper also allows for a more compact use of space. More prisoners can be fit onto one floor 
without needing long corridors while providing almost all of them access to windows. Instead of standard square windows, natural light is supplied by floor to ceiling slit windows. This design lets natural light in but does not allow inmates to use them for escape. The shape also keeps the building pushed back from the street and isolated while still in downtown Chicago. In other words, by the architect's theory, the prison was fantastic, but we still need to take a look at how his design played out in practice. The Metropolitan Correctional Center was intended to house pretrial prisoners and those with short sentences. The bureau that commissioned it added a rule that each prisoner must be divided into self-contained units, with no more than 50 inmates to a unit. That way, prisoners could be easily separated for safety purposes. Violent offenders from non-violent offenders, young offenders from adult ones, men from women, etc. Each prisoner was to be held in an individual cell and provided free access to lounges and recreation areas. For this reason, the design of the prison has not changed throughout the center's history. The Metropolitan Correctional Center has been home to many notable prisoners and events. For example, two convicted murderers, Bernard Welsh and Hugh Coulomb, aren't noteworthy because of the crimes they were sentenced for. Rather, it's because while incarcerated on May the 14th, 1985, they broke open one of the slit windows on the sixth floor and climbed down a 70 foot long electrical cable and escaped. They were eventually found months later one in Pennsylvania and the other in Mississippi. Because of their attempt, bars were installed in all the windows. Then, in 2009, the Metropolitan Correctional Center held Matthew Nolan, brother of film director Christopher Nolan, until he could be extradited to Costa Rica to face charges for falsifying his passport. He was initially charged with kidnapping and murdering Robert Cohen in 2005, but the case was dropped due to insufficient evidence. Once inside, authorities found a razor, a metal clip to pick open his handcuffs, and about 31 feet of rope and a harness made from bed sheets in Nolan's cell. However, it should be pointed out that it would have been physically impossible to escape successfully from the 11th floor cell with the materials he had. Regardless, Nolan was sentenced to 14 months in prison for the attempted escape. In February of 2010, the leader of the Sinaloa cartel was extradited to Chicago to face trial, but because he was deemed a high security risk, he was held in solitary confinement for two years at the center. Guards were on high alert as there was intelligence that his allies might be planning to stage a helicopter escape from the top floor rec yard. Naturally, he was denied access to the rooftop exercise yard to prevent that and keep him away from any possible snipers. In 2011, the cartel man sued the Bureau of Prisons for his treatment, claiming that being denied exercise was a form of cruel and unusual punishment, and therefore a violation of his rights. In the following September, U.S. District Judge Ruben Costello ruled that his placement in solitary confinement was indeed unjustified since he had yet to be convicted. To comply with this ruling, the Bureau of Prisoners transferred the accused to a federal correctional institution with an exercise yard on the ground level. Finally, on December the 18th, 2012, the center was home to a repeat performance. The trouble all started when two convicted bank robbers, Kenneth Conley and Joseph Banks, broke open their window and repelled down from their cell on the 17th floor with a rope made from bedsheets. This was the first successful escape from a secure federal jail since 2006, and the first one at the Metropolitan Correctional Center since the escape back in 1985. However, this time around, the escapees were recaptured in under a month. Banks was found just two days after the escape by the Chicago police. Conley was caught two weeks later in January when breaking into a home. And although their story stands out, the Metropolitan Correctional Center has hosted far more notable names. Although nothing particularly exciting happened during their stay, there have been a few other notable individuals held at the center, such as Joseph Konopka, or as he called himself, Dr. Chaos, who pled guilty in 2002 to two different severe crimes. He damaged power substations and utility facilities to cause blackouts in Wisconsin and stored materials intended to create highly toxic gases in the Chicago subway system. Dr. Chaos was sentenced to 20 years in prison, 
served most of his sentence elsewhere, but he was transferred to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago for his final months. Ultimately, this whack job was released in 2019. Then we have the case of British politician George Contrell, who was arrested while attending the Republican National Convention in 2016. He was federally indicted on 21 counts for planning to commit money laundering, wire fraud, blackmail, and extortion. Contrell was denied bail for being a flight risk and held at the Metropolitan Correctional Center, where he struck a deal with his prosecutors to dismiss most of his charges. In return, he pled guilty to one count of wire fraud and explained most methods for laundering criminal profits. Contrell was sentenced and released in March of 2017. Another well-known guest was former Nigerian Instagram influencer called Hush Puppy. He was extradited to the United States in 2020 and accused of conspiracy to money launder millions, not to mention committing fraud in Nigeria. Hush Puppy, whose real name is Raymond Abs, was denied bail as a flight risk and held at the Metropolitan Correctional Center until sentencing. And in 2022, he was sentenced to over 11 years in federal prison. So that just about wraps things up when it comes to notable criminals, but we still need to discuss the case of R. Kelly. One of the best known prisoners is without a doubt, musician Robert Kelly or R. Kelly whose story really caught the public eye back in January of 2019, when the Lifetime Cable Network began airing a six-part documentary series called Surviving R. Kelly, which laid out allegations of misconduct and sexual abuse. Kelly started to try and discredit his accusers with a little bit of success, but then a second season premiered in 2020, and the final in January of 2023. Back in June of 2019, Kelly had already been arrested on federal charges of sex crimes and obstruction of justice. He was denied multiple requests for bail and pretrial release because of his dangerousness and being a flight risk. By March of 2020, he was facing up to 22 charges. Kelly was held at the Correctional Center from July the 11th, 2019 to June the 23rd, 2021, when he was transferred to the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, where he remained through conviction and sentencing before being transferred to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in 2022 for a trial in Chicago. Kelly's New York trial sentenced him to 30 years in prison. His Chicago trial sentenced him to 20 years, 19 of which were to be served concurrently with his New York sentence bringing him 31 years in prison total. His final sentence was passed down in February of 2023. In April, Kelly was transferred to the Federal Correctional Complex in Butner, North Carolina, where he remains to this day. For clarity, it should also be noted that there were more notable individuals processed by the Metropolitan Correctional Center, but they weren't actually held within the skyscraper. As before 2005, all prisoners at the Correctional Center who needed to be isolated were held in secure housing elsewhere. However, come 2005, that was changed to only male prisoners. Female prisoners needing to be held in solitary confinement were taken to the Cook County Jail instead. One of those prisoners was Piper Kerman. In 1993, Kerman had started dating a heroin dealer. She called Nora in her memoir. Nora worked for a larger operation. And long story short, Kerman began laundering money for them. After a while, she realized the gravity of her situation, broke things off and moved to San Francisco to start over. But eventually, the law caught up with her. Kerman was indicted for money laundering and drug trafficking, to which she pled guilty. She was sentenced to 15 months in a minimum security prison, which due to legal complications didn't start until six years later in 2004. She served 13 months at the Federal Correctional Institution in Danbury, Connecticut. Then ultimately she was transferred to the Metropolitan Correctional Center for the last two. In 2010, Kerman published her memoir about her prison experiences, and you may have heard about it, Orange is the New Black, My Year in a Woman's Prison. In 2013, a television adaptation called Orange is the New Black premiered on Netflix and ran for seven seasons, winning four Emmy Awards. Kerman now serves on the Women's Prison Association board and is a public advocate on behalf of women in correctional institutions. So indeed, the prison was home to some rather well-known names. And now that we got the history down pat, let's take a look at where they would have lived by touring its layout. 
The Metropolitan Correctional Center is at 71 West Van Buren Street. It's 289 feet tall and made with reinforced concrete. It has 27 floors above the ground with one basement level containing a kitchen, a laundromat, and a free to access recreation area for detainees. The Metropolitan Correctional Center parking garage is attached to the south side of the skyscraper. The only place open to the public is the entrance on the ground floor. Anywhere past the lobby is restricted. The first floor also has the prisoner's control room to control all functions in the building, including the doors, elevators, the knockout gas for emergencies, and so on. There's also the employee check-in area, which is a secure entrance for employees and vehicles. And of course, in an undisclosed location is the center's armory. The second floor houses the U.S. Magistrate's courtroom, and the following two floors are administrative offices. On the fifth floor is the admission and discharge area, and the sixth floor is the orientation house. Prisoners and detainees are held there until properly processed and assigned a more permanent location. The 7th and 8th floors are medical housing for inmates that require treatment. Moving up to the ninth floor, we find the education department and this floor also has staff offices and classrooms for any classes that the prisoner residents may want to attend. There's also law and leisure libraries where detainees can check out books or movies for personal education or entertainment, and a debit card operated copier for public use. The 10th floor has all the skyscraper's mechanical utilities. Above that is where the prisoner housing begins. The segregation unit, or more popularly known as solitary confinement, is right above the mechanical equipment level. The 13th through 26th floors are units for detainees. Each unit was designed to house 44 people. They're bi-level with an open two-story lounge in the middle. Each unit has exercise areas, dining areas, and visitor rooms. The stairs and elevators are tucked away in the building's corners. Surprisingly, throughout most of the prison, there is a private room for each detainee with the following amenities. A five inch wide vertical window, a carpeted floor, a wooden vanity, bathroom facilities, a bed platform, and drawers. The first two units are for pretrial inmates only, with the next units as a community-based layout for men. The unit after that is for sentenced inmates, and the two units above that are for detained immigrants. The last unit is a community-based unit for women, and the final floor is the rooftop recreation area and exercise yard. Visible from above, it's surrounded by a 9-meter tall concrete wall with fenced openings around the perimeter. But now, thanks to all that concern over a helicopter escape, a net was installed to cover the rooftop. The Metropolitan Correctional Center is a skyscraper prison located in the middle of downtown Chicago. Despite that, it feels removed from the city around it. The building's shape pushes it back from the street, a row of hedges blocks the entrance from the nearby sidewalk, and the L train blocks off the upper floors. While the MCC was created as a part of a program to increase leniency towards prisoners, there's a reason why its architectural style is called brutalism. Its shape is meant to keep everyone inside and under maximum surveillance. This facility is a skyscraper so that it can hold more people and make escape nearly impossible. And with that said, I'd be curious to hear from anyone who was actually locked up in the skyscraper. What was it like? Let us know in the comments, share your stories, and please consider subscribing. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.